Quantum gravity, you knew I'd get to it in the end. Now, physicist Lee Smolin, nice guy, he published a book about 2000, so about 19 years ago. Three roads to quantum gravity. So there are three different ways we can try and bring general relativity and quantum mechanics together under one roof, as it were. Um, you can start with these two structures, and you can try starting with quantum field theory and trying to find a way to make space and time emerge in it, make it background independent. Richard Feynman actually had a go at that, um, but then got hopelessly uh, bogged down, and it didn't work. But he wasn't disheartened. That was about the 1960s. You can say, well, forget general relativity and quantum mechanics. I'm going to start over. And a few brave souls have actually taken that road. I'll talk about one of them uh, later on. Or you can do what I'm going to talk about, which is start with general relativity and find a way to, as it were, quantize this, introduce a quantum element to it. So the first thing you need to do is to start by reformulating general relativity so that it looks like a quantum field theory. Now, if you're not familiar with the mathematics, you might say, oh, Jim, that's easy. I could do that over breakfast. Let me tell you, it's not easy. Here's the problem. When a particle moves about on a flat surface, um, we don't have to worry about which way it points. Now, why should I be worried about which way anything points? Well, physics is full of things called vectors. Um, an electron has a spin and it points in a magnetic field up or down. So vectors are important, and the way things point is fundamental to the way physics works. So if I have a particle pointing upwards, let's say, and I move it about on a flat surface, that's okay. I can happily do that. The way I move it about won't affect the way it's pointing. Ah, But in general relativity, space-time can be curved. Well, here's the ultimate curvature, a sphere. Let's see what happens to a vector as we move it around a sphere. Now, I'm going to use a wickedly ingenious invention here called a south-pointing chariot. The Chinese invented these in the third century. This is before the magnetic compass. And if you wanted to have any idea of where you were going, you needed something. So they came up with this south-pointing chariot, which has a carving on the top that points. And this ingenious gear mechanism underneath that means it keeps pointing in that direction even though the cart may turn. Isn't that clever? So let's take our south-pointing chariot and wheel it all the way to the equator, starting from the North Pole. We get it to the equator, and then we turn to the east. But remember, the south-pointing chariot keeps pointing south. Okay, So we'll go a quarter of the way around the equator, and then we'll make our way back home. And you can see that by the time we get back to the North Pole, the chariot is now pointing at right angles to where it was pointing when it set off. Moving although we haven't done anything specifically to the way it points, moving it around the surface of the sphere has changed the orientation of the vector. Now, any theory based on general relativity which allows for space-time curvature has to accept. It's known as the parallel transport of a vector. Fortunately, um, in the early 1980s, two uh, Indian theorists, uh, Amitabha Sen and Abhay Ashtakar, uh, came up with a connection theory which allowed general relativity to be reformulated. And when it was reformulated, it looked exactly like a quantum field theory. Now, again, I don't want to take credit away from Sen and Ashtakar who worked on this, but Einstein and, in fact, uh, Austrian physicist Erwin Schrödinger were there before. Uh, but they struggled with the mathematics of these connection-type theories. But if it 
looks just like a quantum field theory, your next question is, well, a quantum field theory of what exactly? We're going to create a quantum field theory of gravity. We, we need objects for it to be a theory of, don't we? Well, the inspiration um, for what this might be a theory of uh, came from something called lattice quantum chromodynamics. Now, quantum chromodynamics is the field theory for what's known as the color force. And the color force is what binds quarks together inside protons and neutrons. And what I didn't tell you when I put up the little equivalent of the periodic table was that quarks are not only up and down, charm and strange, top and bottom, although I do wish we'd stuck with the original names for those last two quarks, which was truth and beauty. In addition to flavor, up, down, charm, strange, and so on, quarks also possess color. Now, physicists were running out of ideas at this time, so they just call them red, green, and blue. They're not literally red, green, or blue, okay? But they have quantum properties that we characterize as red, a red quark, a red up quark, a green down quark, and a blue up quark together make a proton. And what you can see in these little threads here with the arrows is the gluons that bind them together. And the way that this force works is in fact like um, they're held in a net. If I try to pull and separate the quarks, I I'm actually going to hit some resistance. They're really held together uh, very, very strongly. These force lines are loose when the quarks are close together, but if I try to pull them apart, they kind of snap uh, and, and prevent me from getting the quarks out. Now, the problem is the equations of quantum chromodynamics are really um, quite complex, and they're impossible to solve analytically. You won't find a book where you've got an answer at the end that says, you know, uh, you know quark energy is QED. Um, you need to solve these equations on a computer. And one of the techniques used to solve these equations on a computer is called lattice quantum chromodynamics. It's a technique. Now, uh, again, I couldn't run calculations of lattice QCD on my laptop. I need a supercomputer and a lot of supercomputer time. In other words, I need a grant. Um, and you construct a lattice. This is space and, for that matter, time. Entirely artificial. I assume that I can organize my quarks and my gluons on this lattice. I put the quarks at the intersection points of the lattice. And I allow the gluons to run between them in all the different ways that gluons can interact. And the way that lattice QCD works is that I have a certain distance between the lattice points and I do a calculation. I then shrink a little bit that distance and I do another calculation. And I shrink it a bit more and I do another calculation. And so on and so on. And then I extrapolate all the way to zero lattice separation. Lattice, uh, zero lattice um, link. Um, and that allows me to get to something that looks like a continuum of space and time without the need to actually um, do the calculation at zero. But look at this picture. We've got, of course, we've got the, the quarks, we've got gluons running around the lattice, the links between the lattice points. Um, but over on the left there, we've actually got quarks running around in a circle. Without any, uh, we've got gluons, sorry, running around in a circle without any quarks. And one of the reasons that's possible is that unlike a photon. A photon is not electrically charged. So when I bring the two electrons together that you saw in an earlier slide, and a virtual photon passes between them and they move off in a different direction, um, that photon is not charged. But the gluons have color charge, as it said. So they not only interact with quarks, they interact with themselves, which is why quantum chromodynamics is a bit of a beast. Everything interacts with everything else. It's a real mess. But it means that gluons can run around in circles. And so here's a thought. Um, 
There's a physicist, Kenneth Wilson, had the idea. He was interested in trying to create an analytical structure for quantum chromodynamics. And he wondered if it might be possible to create a situation whereby we do without the quarks and the lattice. And all we've got left then is the loops. The loops of force running around in a circle. And this was the inspiration for loop quantum gravity. Except the loops are not gluons. They're now loops of gravitational force, in inverted commas. Okay. So loop quantum gravity kicked off in about <coughs> the mid-'80s. And initially, it was um, all about the loops and the way that these intersect. Um, then it became, well, well, maybe they not. And so the physicists, the theorists involved reached for the theory of knots. I'm not going to say that's a knotty problem. Um, so you, you, you've got some characteristic knots here. That's a trefoil knot on the top left there. Uh, underneath, you've got a trefoil knot, but it's just going round and round, so you can get a perspective on it. Uh, next to it is something called a whitehead link. Two loops, but twisted together and, and, and knotted together so they can't be separated. And the final one there is called the Borromean rings. Fans of the Marvel Cinematic Universe in the audience? Knots feature very heavily in Norse mythology. So next time you look at an older version of um, an Avengers movie or a Thor movie, look for the knot on Thor's hammer. You'll find, in fact, they've used a trefoil knot. It's something you can do in an idle moment. Okay, then, okay, maybe what's important is the way that we weave these loops together. Now, this is a weave created by taking a whole bunch of key rings and linking them together. In fact, the Italian theorist Carlo Rovelli joked that he used all the available key rings in Verona to build this. And then, okay, in the final step, these were replaced by something called Penrose Spin Networks. Now, Roger Penrose was Stephen Hawking's PhD advisor at Cambridge. He's a smart guy. But he also likes, he's that kind of theorist that likes to plow very much his own furrow. And he invented this structure primarily as a way of satisfying what he thought space ought to be like, which is quantum in nature, by coming up with a network that would do just that. He didn't have any physical significance attached to these networks. And so what happened is that the theorists developing loop quantum gravity found the networks that Penrose had invented some years before entirely at a whim. And that kind of thing happens in science. It's a happy, happy set of circumstances. So I want to be clear. We will look at these pictures and imagine these loops existing in space. It's the way I've drawn them. How else can I draw them? But in fact, in loop quantum gravity, these are space. Space is these. They don't exist in space. They make space. I know. It's difficult to get your head around. <laughs> 